The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again, as soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging, and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. Mm -hmm. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined. We are imperfect, and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. When the president pats me on the back and said, God bless you, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> I can't top that. So we're going to breathe. I am serious. Dr. Condor Fraser just gave us a lot to chew on. Pause for a minute. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Ground yourself. Put your feet on the ground. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath from your, from your belly. Breathe like a baby. Take in the message. Take in the challenge. Take in the call. And exhale, Sail. The fear. The paralysis, the skepticism, the doubt, the fears. Keep breathing from your belly. And I invite God to remind you what Dr. Condor Fraser just mentioned. 
She had a lot of slides, and I'm sure she's going to share them with you. But may the Holy Spirit continue to allow you to remember all the important things that she said. So it slowly come from that moment, that space of taking it all in. And allow me to talk a little bit. And I'm going to be very honest. It's hard to be here. And when I um, was reminded I had to respond to Dr. Condé Fraser, I thought to myself, what in the world did I do? <laughs> like, what was I thinking? Because why? First of all, why did they invite me to this thing? I'm not a theologian, you know? And then I had to pause for a minute and remind myself, I know why. I know why they invited me to talk. Because I'm the only and the first Latina that is tenure at Fuller. Okay. But I'm not, I'm not saying that to boast. I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying this to illustrate the issue of privilege that my dear Dr. Condor Fraser was talking about. And I say that because in case you were looking for a theologian and instead you get the closest thing that you get is a, the, a PK, that of a pastor, a, a, a theologian wannabe maybe, what you see is privilege. Privilege is that you can be imperfect in public, and people are not going to say, oh, there he goes, there he goes. I always knew not. I always knew that these PK kids do not know squat about theology. Privilege is that you don't have to carry the burden of representation on your shoulders. You know, because if I screw up in my theological musings, no one is going to say, oh, that's... That proves that all the Latina faculty women at Fuller don't know what they're talking about. Instead, they will say, oh, that's Lisette. That's Lisette, the storytelling Lisette. Anyway, so after that disclaimer, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I'm a psychologist. And in the field of psychology, we also encounter similar issues that Dr. Conde Fraser has been talking about. And I'm not going to go into that uh, because even our research says that uh, there's an article that said even the rat was white. <laughs> that tells you a lot. That tells you a lot. But I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. But I, I'm not here to talk about psychology. I'm just trying to highlight for you another point here, and that is that each of us have intersectionalities of identities that allow us to experience the world through multiple lenses. Right. Yes, people have intersectionalities of identities. There is more uh, to identity that you can know from your initial encounter with someone. Because for example, when I walk in the room right after Dr. Fraser, on the Fraser, uh, you might instantly saw, know some things about some of my identities. The accent, my accent gets away, right? Um, and you don't know some other things about my identities. Think for a minute what you know about me by just seeing me. And many things and a woman of color, and a foreigner. I have an accent. I'm Colombian by birth. I am a naturalized US citizen, and a psychologist working in a marriage and family department at Fuller Theological Seminary, and a Christian, and a mother. And I mention this because I love the um, the, the concept that Dr. Condé Fraser mentioned about the community of 
perichoresis. Is that how you pronounce it? The relationship where each of a person interpenetrates or is in intersectionality with the other. I pause for a minute to think about that. When I have all these multiple identities and I bring it and I allow you to take it for me, I span your world thousands of times. You span my world in ways that are incredible. The richness, the depth, the breadth, the infinity of diversity that God had in mind is just mind-blowing. So let's dig deep and take that image with us. The image of diversity and endless possibilities. Now, let's come back here to the crude reality of today. Dr. Crumble Fraser um, reminded us of the um, that is fraught with multiple, many isms, sexism, racism, you name it, the white supremacy. She invited us to consider the pervasive nature of sin, of, rac of racism and power. The sinfulness of a man, that man makes it inevitable that a dominant class group, sex, will seek to define a relationship which guarantees dominance as a permanently normative. Let me just remind you that uh, target groups um, are groups that have been historically or currently been targeted for oppression or discrimination maltreatment as a group. And dominant groups, white supremacy, are those groups who are historically, uh, who are def had defined the norm, whatever it is in a particular culture. Now, most people have a mixture of dominant and target group's identities. And we are aware of one over the other, oftentimes, and an oppressor, but an also an oppressed person. And a member of the target group by virtue of being an immigrant, of being a woman of color. There's a whole list. But I'm being reminded that I'm also a member of the dominant group because I have a PhD. I have a PhD. And I've been reminded of that in my work in Colombia. See, the history of the denomination in Colombia is a classic example of how power and economic agendas drive and erode the very good Christian intentions of mission. My dad was a leader in the Colombian church and within my denomination, so I had to consult with him. I did a little quick interview. You know, for multiple reasons. He's getting old, and I'm trying to get all his memories. Um, but I also wanted to know a little bit more about the story of the omissions, the, the, our denomination in, in Colombia. And he started telling me that examples, a story that was plagued by many examples of um, white supremacy mistakes. Of course, in the interest of time, I don't have the time to elaborate on this story. and. Um, but I do want to share a picture that touched my heart. It's this picture, he showed it to me. He was telling me that um, the seminary in Colombia, in Medellin in particular, belonged to, was run by a mission sponsored by the, in the United States. And that there was a long process that they, they, the faculty 
were the missionaries, were run by the missionaries. Money came from the missionaries from abroad. The whole thing was a foreign, foreign uh, run by foreigners. And he told me that it took many years, that in fact the process of change began in the 60s, where the nationals, the Colombians, began to own their spaces of education, higher education, and in particular, theological education. And that through many fights, many conflicts, many tears and tribulations, they came to a point in the, sixth, in the 70s when a good part of the faculty were nationals, almost half and half ratio, nationals and missionaries or folks from abroad. And he was very proud of this picture. I was like, you know, I, I was a little in a rush, like, gotta go, tell me the story. Quickly. And he kept stuck on this picture and like, oh, and like that. He's like, look, you know, we were a team, I mean, there were more people obviously in the faculty, but they were apparently assigned to draft a new way to work in together, nationals and foreigners, to redesign the curriculum so that it would be much more contextual. So they would be driven by the necessities and the needs and the wishes of the nationals, not the wishes of the foreigners. He was part of that important time in history. Very proud of that. And he added another thing that's, that I thought was beautiful. He's a wise old man. He said, you know what? The Americanos, or the missionaries, were very good. They had good intentions. They were great people. We loved them. But they missed something. They didn't get it. They forgot that they were training young people, that they were educating minds, young minds, and that you start from the bottom, yes, you have to take care of them, and then at some point, you have to walk side by them, and at the other point, you have to move away from them to give the space for them to lead. That's where they got in trouble. And it's the economic and the power issue that didn't let go. They did not want to let go. And I thought, oh my goodness. So I left when I was 16. A lot of things had happened then, and I'm gonna give my shameless plug for my little article <laughs> story that I wrote in the Fuller Magazine that tells you a little bit of what we're doing in Colombia right now. Because I have gone back, you know. After many, many years, I go back to the same seminary to work the same seminary where my dad used to work. A lot of things have changed, and I was blown away the first time I went there. Because the seminary is run by the nationals. Yes, there are foreigners teaching, but it's all run by the nationals. It's an interdenominational group, all, all kinds of things. And even the president of the seminary is a woman. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Things change. <laughs> um, so suffice to say that now in this moment in time, the seminary is engaged in this very intentional way to raise in consciousness regarding the, the 50 plus years of internal conflict in Colombia and the role of the church in the midst of tragedy. And really trying to generate knowledge, to generate challenge, to help the church embrace that political, that practical action that they ought to be taking in moments such as this. And in this huge research project um, that's multidisciplinary, they invited me to be part of this team, psychology team, and to lead it with other Colombians. And we have an economics team, an education team, a legal team. It's, it's really amazing work. So I lead this Colombian team, this psychology Colombian team that is working with a theologian, trying to understand 
and trying to gather information about psychological issues, in particular trauma, and how we can help the church, give tools to the church to work with trauma in the midst of this pain. Si sí se puede, si sí señora. <laughs> but now I'm going to have to tell you something. And it's embarrassing. I, I've been so proud. I'm like, oh, my God, the nations are running this. Look at this. And now they are, have these multidisciplinary teams. And, yes, they are now inviting folks from abroad to help out. My team has members from, from the States, from South Africa, Colombian psychologists, uh, 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 Colombian psychologists, psycho uh, Colombian sociologists. I mean, it's a fantastic group of people with many expertise. And one of the tasks uh, for this second year is that we have to develop um, materials for the church that are informed by the data. They're coming up from the ground up, from interviews with people in situations of displacement, from faith leaders, and so forth. We have a plethora of information of what is it that they need, what do they think is supported, is supported what is not, uh, how can we help them better from the standpoint of the church. So we are meeting all these agendas because, you know, it's a research project and we have to meet center deadlines because the grants said so and so forth. And we have to come up with these plans for uh, a uh, work group for pastors, a curriculum for internal displaced peoples within the church, a guide for Christian psychologists. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, I don't have the time. <laughs> so I start assigning. As a good leader, I start assigning jobs, right? You do this, you do this, everybody's doing something. And I made one decision that I regret now. Because I told my American colleague, please write this lesson plan. Don't worry. He said, but I, uh, I, I'm going to have to write it in English. I said, don't worry, don't worry. We'll translate it. Don't worry. I should have known better. I know better. We are in a project that's supposed to be coming from integral missiology, from community participatory research, from the ground up, and I'm having asking an American to write the lesson plan. Oh, my dominant group kick in. My PhD kick in. Okay, the time crunch is, give me a little grace on that one. But, <laughs> but it did, and I have to humbly when he did all, I mean, did all his great work. I love this man. He is an expert. He, uh, he, he's a true colleague. He did his good work. And I read it, and I thought, what have I done? What have I done? I know better than that. You can't translate these basic things. And doing, and recycling, I'm back in this structure. It was very humbling to have to call and say, <clears throat> thanks, my no thanks. We're going to have to start doing everything in Spanish for now. And I have plenty of people that are doing that. Very humbling for me. Very humbling for the entire group. Not that they are, that my, my English-speaking colleagues are out of the picture. They are bringing a wealth of information to the work that we do. But I have to prioritize the Colombians. Yeah. Yeah. They are the ones driven the agenda. They are the ones developing the thoughts, what's needed. So that was one uh, rude awakening. A reminder that con colonization is not an event. It's a process that undergo for centuries, and it continues. That discrimination is usually not an event, but something that happens repeatedly. It's a process. It's a drip of acid that slowly, drip by drip, killing me softly, Dr. Scrum the Fraser, kills you, cracks the rock. So let me quickly bring you back. How are we doing with time? I don't even know. OK. What? Break time. OK, give me, give me three minutes. Give me three minutes. Give me three minutes. I'll, I'll, I'm going to read very quickly like Dr. Conde Fraser. <laughs> Let me bring you back. Take a plane with me, and we're going to enter the stairs legally again uh, with the goal of um, um, 
highlighting uh, another aspect that I think is very important that I, I, I took from, uh, uh, from the reflections. And that is that we, to move to a critical social consciousness uh, that brings us back to a theology which, ur uh, uh, which urges us to, be, to live the gospel through our actions in our local communities, we must seek to transform injustice and alienation. You know, in the field of psychology, there's another, in, in the social sciences, there's another perspective, the anti-domination perspective, that says that either you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And we tend to think, oh, no, no, I always part of the solution. But the perspective says there's no such a thing as a bystander, passive bystander. And I do a lot of work in trauma. And we know in trauma, particularly the bystander phenomenon, it's detrimental. It's a killer. Because we know that one, that one of the ways in which people are harmed is not just that someone harms them but that people stand by and watch as the harm occurs and do nothing. Okay. And uh, now I was gonna give you an example of Katrina. Oh no, but let me, with all due respect, with my African-American friends here, let me give you something more recent in honor of the lady of the Coquis, Puerto Rico. So we just got hit by a hurricane. A reasonably assumed thing is that the government will provide and help. You know, because lots of people, there are lots of people in Puerto Rico. It's a colony of the US. Why wouldn't you help? But people are experiencing a betrayal trauma, a secondary traumatization. And not so much because of the hurricane. I mean, it does impact. And not neglecting that piece is huge, right? But we do know that natural disasters like hurricanes and floods do impact people and do leave a mark. But nothing like the realization that the government has failed to protect. Are we going to be like Katrina again with Puerto Rico? I think we are already. Uh, when we interviewed the elders in Katrina, they said, well, listen, you know, we, we have been through a lot of hurricanes. We have been through a lot of floods. This is worse because the government left us down and they left us to die. And why did, this pe did these people were left to die or drown? Because they were poor and African-American. Because they were Puerto Ricans. Because they were the target groups. Yeah. So where is the church in all this? Why are we not saying much about this? Why are we just wearing witness? Being a passive bystander. I have been actively advocating um, through my research for a just and human treatment of unauthorized people in the United States, particularly um, uh, trying to document the impact of detention and deportation on citizen children. And through my work, I came to know one of my students. And I'm going to say her name because she's very public about this. In fact, you could go check the web page of Fuller, and you'll see her story. Norma, she's a DACA recipient. She's actually one of the plaintiffs in a class action suit by six dreamers um, who are suing the administration for choosing to let DACA die. I also, through this work, have come to know Jennifer, a DACA recipient and an alumni from Fuller. And of course, they're more than DACA. They have many other beautiful identities 
They're beautiful. They're strong. They're fighters. They have big hearts. They have big dreams. Big dreams that are on hold. As a Christian psychologist of Fuller, in a time such as need, at such as this, I need Norma and I need Jennifer to keep me accountable, to remind me that what it's like to experience the acid drip day by day of uncertainty, of exclusion, my insecurity, to, to put me the fire in my belly, to disregard my shaking voice, my shaking knees, my insecurities as a member of a target group that often is disregarded and instead to speak up on their behalf. I was humble of the amazing gift that they bring to Fuller just last week because these brave women organized a student-led prayer vigil on campus every day at noon, praying for DACA, praying for the undocumented, for the documented. Every day they invited others to share in their pain, their uncertainty, their outrage, their disappointment, their anger, their lament, their cries out to God. They invited others to be curious about their other identities as well. Indeed, we all need Normas and Jennifers to remind us of the cruel realities of disparities, of exclusion, of systems of fraud within our, uh, our Fuller, to shake us from our seminary Christian bubble. Yes, on the other hand, Norma, Jennifer, and the 800,000 plus documented folks in the U.S. United States also need me. They need me to remind them to take care of themselves. Yeah. To think like a white male. <laughs> Let me tell a story about that. I have this great, strong African American colleague in a secular institution that I often call when I'm in trouble. And I ran and like, oh, can you help me? Is this, is he being a jerk or I, or is this me? Is this racism or, or, or I'm being just too soft to hear? Or what is the crime? And she listens to my complaints and rants. And then she says, she said, dig deep and think like a male, like a white male. I, I, I laugh, I always laugh like, wah, wah, wah. I actually had turned that mantra to be a little bit more Christocentric. <laughs> I dig deep and I think like a child of God. I dig deep and pull my imagio day. And I am trying to help my students know that. They have to dig deep and find that image of citizens of the kingdom of God. I invite you to stand with Norma, with Jennifer, and the 800,000 documented folks in the U.S., in the US and say, no more, that's enough, okay? To remind yourself that anti-domination perspective says you are doing nothing, to, if you're not doing nothing to change cultures of mistreatment, then you're participating as a passive bystander. That's my challenge for you today.